My name's Doug Rawlings. I'm the host of this uh, poetry reading session. Um, and uh, I want to welcome everybody here. And the, uh, the basic format is going to be this. We've got a, a, a recording from our poet laureate, uh, Jenny Pakanowski, and then uh, she and her uh, mentor, if you will, Jan Berry, who is the former poet laureate before Jenny, um, will also have a, a, a reading. And then myself and Teresa Shuk will be sharing some poems back and forth. And then we have three people signed up to read. We have Augustine Abarca, Janet Wheel, and Daniel Glover. And then after that such those poets are done, um, we have an open floor, an open mic, if you will. Uh, and we ask people to, if they're going to read poems, to please try to keep them under five minutes. Um, uh, I, I have this uh, uh, amazing power to reach into your room and shut you down if you go over five minutes. Uh, and then I also will charge your credit card an extra 25 bucks. So don't go over five minutes if you can help. Okay, is everybody good with that? All right, um, so Ellen and, and Becky and uh, Sean are going to be our, our uh, technical um, stars to keep this thing going, not me for sure. Um, and so we're gonna start with that, uh, the video of uh, um, Jenny Pekanowski. Hey reading. Doug, one question. Yes. Doug Lumis, I think I sent you an application uh, and I sent you a poem. But you didn't mention my name. I didn't uh, get it, Doug. You know what? That's okay. You're on the list now. Okay. okay. Same with me, Doug. Steve Morris. Same deal. Steve? Okay. God, I didn't get any of those things, guys. Sorry. Okay. So Doug, Doug Loomis, Steve Morris. Yeah. Okay. And also Dieter Bob Dieter Hansen. Harkin. And who? Bob Dieter Hansen. Bob Hansen. Bob Hansen. Okay. Got it. I, and I thought I saw Hassan, Hassan Clement. Hansen, Hansen. Hassan Clement. Okay. Wonderful. Good. All right. We're rocking and rolling. Let's do it. And so let's. Uh, can, if you could play that video, please. Yes. Every, uh, can I ask everybody to uh, to mute themselves? And I'm just going to start the video now. Becky, did you hit the share sound button? Becky, did and you hit the share I, sound? Do I need to unmute myself? What do I need to do? Wait, I can't hear you. You're muted. Ellen, you're Ellen. Guess what? You're muted. Sorry, because I'm well behaved. So when yes. you pull up the the window to share at the bottom left, you have to hit the share sound. Got it. Okay, I'll start over then. Thank you. Yes, Becky. Let's try and you that. have to hit play. <laughs> right, right. But first I have to click share sound and then click on the video. And then here we go again. Bridge back home for more. A conversation through poetry about the impact of war. Can you turn it up a little bit? Possible. Long ago, ancient warrior cultures, we believe, had magnificent storytelling rituals of homecoming from military service back to civilian society. We believe this reintegration process of ritual storytelling was essential to the success of how warriors returned home, mind, body, and spirit. The civilians that received them listened and shared what happened to them while the warriors were away. It was a reconnection, sharing experiences, reuniting in mind, body, and soul as an entire community. 
The military and society of today does not practice such rituals, and the lack of reunification of civilian and warrior, civilian and veteran, has created a plague of homelessness, addiction, isolation, and suicide. Today, this moment, in this play, we modernize this ritual storytelling of homecoming for all that have served home and abroad. Everyone in the military trained to fight wars, and each one of us contributed to that goal, no matter what our job was. Whether it was administrative, such as pay, mail, supply, or a cook, or a grunt, kicking down doors, medics, corpsmen, healing the wounded. We were all part of the machine, and now we can all be part of the solution. And yet still veterans have to deal with the cliches and are bombarded with these misconstrued sentiments. So, we turn it up. hot in Iraq? Thank you for your service. <clears throat> Vietnam veterans prefer welcome home. So where is Vietnam? What did you think of the Bush administration? What did you think of the Nixon administration? Mm, I saw in the news that women are raped in the military. Were you raped? How many babies did you kill in Vietnam? Were you really there in Iraq or just behind a desk? How many people did you kill? Thank you for your service. How many people did you kill? Thank you for your service. Oh, I mean, welcome home. Thank you for your service. Don't thank me. You have no idea what I did over there. Just before Veterans Day, the VA sent a letter declaring I'm 100% disabled from disabilities that struck light in life due to the war in Vietnam. This is beyond amazing. Not that long ago, the VA told Vietnam vets it was all in our heads, that our mothers caused our problems, that it was none of their business. I could tick off the insults decade by decade, and now, just like that, I'm accepted into the inner sanctum of war heroes. No purple heart but an Agent Orange admission ticket to VA care. It can creep up on you. You came back in pretty good shape, but knew others who died. You'd rather not hear war news, but can't avoid war dreams so vivid you wake in a sweat. With each new war, old nightmares reflare. A buddy email says he's tired of endless battling with PTSD. Another calls to ask, did you hear about that vet who committed suicide? And then there's Dave, who fought the war demons every which way and died worn out at 60. What the hell are you gonna do? You talk to some older folks who've lived a lot of life, join groups tackling veterans problems and civic groups for good causes, get assistance for stuff from Vietnam, like the malaria some VA guy said you couldn't have, mm. and rage at war's senselessness that's not on any casualty list. But life keeps piling it on. Kids barely out of summer camp are enlisted to invade distant places. Peaceful folks are brutally assaulted in war zones and here at home. You try a survivor's support group, then another one after wife dies. Write, talk, create art about war. Share what's happening with others. One day, damn, you're an old timer who has lived a lot of life after a war. So what promises did the Army make to you? <clears throat> I wish someone had told me that I would have to work my entire life to find all the pieces of me that chipped off like paint over the last 20 years. My body became too unsafe for my soul to occupy, and my uterus became infertile ground zero, an innocent bystander who would live in constant fight or flight, eviscerating anything that entered into her. At the recruitment office, they should be required to say, hey, you can go to college or pay off your student loan debt. However, your mind, your body may not actually ever be well enough to go to college or university. You may become so dehumanized, your soul become tethered to you instead of part of you. You may become so disconnected from other humans. Some days you may only see enemies and targets creating casualties instead of families. 
and death. Oh, death will latch onto you like a baby to a mother's milk. You see, they call it uterine infertility. My uterus won't conceive life. My uterus doesn't feel safe. She contracts with rage and expels venom about lost love, lost self, lost time. It's the desert damages. My uterus wonders why I didn't love her or maybe why I didn't soothe her with the compassion that I give the dogs and most other people. She has become militarized to protect from infiltration an armored uterus with a hyper-vigilant heart. In the fine print of your contract, it should state, it may be easier to die on duty in the throes of battle instead of navigating the civilian world, a culture your brain can no longer comprehend. Your main comforts will be rage, violence, depression, sadness. You will be exposed untested anthrax vaccines, burn pits, depleted uranium, alcohol, prescribed poison, and let's not forget the physical brutality of your own doing and by the leadership training you. They broke you down to build you back up to serve and survive. Then they tossed you to the side for new blood and new brains. Let the civilians deal with you now, the aging body service members without service we are the backbone of america that can no longer walk my future children will be disintegrated by the stress that courses through me by the war inflicted on me because i believed in the promise the promise of a better life the american dream to serve and i admit it i believe now, today, we must rebuild into the empowered veteran, surrounded by my tribe. I am learning to listen to you, my body, my uterus, the holder of life. I want to promise you that it's safe. Let me wash away the sand, purify the venom. Let me hold you in my embrace of warmth. Let my children become the witness of our love. Let us grow with peace and thrive. That's it. <laughs> wow. So there is proud to say our poet laureate, Jenny. And sitting next to her was our poet laureate before her, Jan Berry, and now I am the first poet laureate before Jan and Jenny. Uh, and so uh, what I want to do is uh, use that prestigious position to take over the, the thing for a while here with my partner, Teresa Maychuk. Um, and we we have uh, um, collaborated and put together a book called Cautre. And I think, um, Teresa, you might want to uh, tell everybody about it. Um, so I, I have a little introduction. Um, I was honored to meet Doug Rawlings via email a few years ago. In our correspondence, we exchanged poems and discovered that through our poetic conversations, we found a bridge that connected us and our diverse experiences in, in relation to the American War in Vietnam. I was a boat refugee. It has been a healing process bringing our stories and poems from different quote unquote sides of the war together in a meeting place of humanity where I think we both feel seen and heard. I'm really grateful to be a part of this space of healing with veterans. My father was a veteran. He fought in Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And he was in a Viet Cong prison camp for nine years. And my mom was pregnant with me when while he was there. So um, I met him when I was nine. And there's that traumatic experience there. Um, I think our healing, the veterans and the refugees, and everyone impacted by war 
are inextricably tied together. I truly feel when you heal, when I see that you're healing, Doug, and um, the other veterans are healing, I am healing as well. So I'm very grateful for everyone here, for Susan, Doug, Becky, for Veterans of Peace. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, you and, want... Yeah, and, and then we we, we we put this book together <laughs> called Bamboo Bridge. Well, uh, please read us a, a, a poem, Teresa, would you please? Okay, sure. So I'm going to start with a poem um, dedicated to a dear friend, poet, math teacher of mine who recently passed away. Her name is Amy. Uyematsu, and she wrote an essay called The Emergence of Yellow Power in America, and this poem is called Yellow Power. In middle school, I would look in the mirror and tell myself, I am beautiful over and over again, even though looking at billboards, magazines, and TV, I thought that I was not. My nose is the right size. I am the right height. My black hair is the right color. My brown eyes are beautiful. My skin is the right color. There is nothing wrong with me. When my tongue stumbles over English words and grammar, it's because I already hold two native languages within me, carried across the ocean in our refugee boat, Vietnamese and Cantonese. It's okay if I do not hold a knife, fork, and spoon the correct way. They aren't my utensils of choice. Chopsticks were my first utensils. I could use them to do a thousand things. Pick up rice grains one by one. Cut noodles, hold up my hair in a bun. My school lunch sometimes smells of fish sauce. Look, mum. Some kids ask what that stinky smell is. A sauce from my Vietnamese motherland, so loved by my family and people. I too refuse to feel shame and exclaim myself. I am nuk mum, delicious and proud, scent and taste that will remain. Thank you, Teresa. What a, what a, a real honor to to be sharing poems with you. Uh, so what we're going to do is swap a couple of poems back and forth here, and then we'll get to other folks. Um, this poem I wrote, uh, I, I have, I've been blessed to have returned to Vietnam uh, two weeks ago. I was there for 12 days with my son, Josh, and I went as part of a conference um, that the Vietnamese people were putting on called Engaging with Vietnam, uh, Living Heritage, Living with the Heritage. And I would not have gone back as a visitor, um, I was there 53 years ago with the 715th Artillery in the Central Highlands. But um, I was asked to come back and read, and read some poems as part of this uh, conference. And we were representing the uh, resistance to the war uh, using Ron Carver's book. So here's a poem I wrote about that experience called Vietnam Redux, Going Back for my son, Josh. I look twice now where I used to look only once like where roots two and four merge with route 156. Or when my imagination takes me to a little village just on the other side of the river Styx. Where there truly was hell to pay those many years ago, across that river and up and down those swirling tides, where Beelzebub got to play with this gift box of G.I. Joes as we desperately hung on for his satanic little ride. I went back to that land of my 50-year-old dreams, thinking I'd finally put some nightmares out to pasture, hoping to quiet down those mama san beetle mouth screams, looking for that proverbial sense of closure. But who am I to expect more from this madly tortured land that once swallowed up my illusions of masculine grandeur and spat out a soldier boy who had tried to become a man, only to become a tool of that mindless, endless, slaughter. Teresa, Thank you. you got one? Yes. Wow. So the, the... Hmm. 
Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Very moving poem. This poem that I'm going to read is based on a true story. It's based on my boat refugee experience as recounted by my mother to me. Guan um, on a dragon. So Guan um, is the Bodhisattva of compassion. Guan um, on a dragon. Mother shows me a lacquered painting on a plaque of Guan um, Bodhisattva of compassion riding a dragon. It is misty around the Bodhisattva and the dragon. The picture looks so real, almost like a photo. A sacred vase in one hand and a willow branch in the other to bless devotees with the divine nectar of life. Mother says that she and other boat refugees saw Guan Um as we were fleeing Vietnam after the war in a freight boat with 2,450 refugees. When she looked up towards heaven in the clouds, she saw the Bodhisattva in her white flowing robe riding a dragon. Mother says that the goddess was there to guide and save us from the strong waves of the South China Sea. I should know better than to believe her though she swears it's true. I ask again and she nods, says, really? I saw Guan Um in the clouds as we were escaping. I should know better than to believe her, but a part of me wants to believe in a Bodhisattva, in compassion riding on a mythical creature, to believe that somehow something more than just our mere human selves wanted us to live. Thank you, Teresa. Um, this poem I'm going to read now is called Giving Silence. And it's I, I really thought of this poem as I was reading Margaret Mead accounts of New Guinea and how um, a tribes would at the at about the age of 12 or 13, they'd make a big deal about grabbing young men and dragging them away from the village and the mothers would scream and, and bring them back, bring them back. And the fathers would drag, drag them into the jungle where the fathers then would sit down with them in a circle and they'd draw their own blood, pour it into a gourd and pass it to the young boys to drink. And then they said, now you are a man. And they returned to the village and the mothers welcomed them as men. Well, this culture does not have anything like that. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid many people think it's the military that turns us into men. So I wrote this poem called Giving Silence for my son Josh and his friend David when they turned 13. This is called Giving Silence. If Nam vets were ancient shamans, now would be the moment we choose to give you shelter from our coming storm, from the coming storm. But we are merely survivors of suburbs and cities, not forest nor mountain. Modern men offering you our silences, our words to guide you going out on your own. Yet we have known for years now that the silences of our fathers will not do. And we have found that words alone cannot be the sacred knives you need to bleed you free of your raging doubts. So listen up to what we have found between our own silences. Open up your fists, watch women move, scorn uniforms, don't march, dance. He listened, by the way. Got a jumping jack for us? Yes, jumping jack, the M16 mines. In standing position with arms to the side, jump while spreading the legs and lift arms above the head. Jump back into standing position and up again. Spread the legs lift and lifting the arms above the head. Repeat. When a M16 landmine is triggered, it will spring into the air and explode with the capacity to level everything in a 150 meter radius, deadly shrapnel spreading a further 350 meters. Metal casings from an unexploded bomb can fetch 25,000 Vietnamese dong, or a dollar, for a poor family in Vietnam. Men comb the forests and beaches of Quang Tri, looking for the metal that will feed their family. 
risking their lives. Children working in the fields think it's a toy they found. Nguyen was hoeing a small piece of land his parents gave him when an unexploded U.S. military bomb was triggered and blew off both his hands. When I returned to Vietnam two, two, three weeks ago. I was fortunate enough to hook up with Chuck Searcy, who was the director of Project Renew. And he took me for a tour around for four or five days. We drove around. We drove up to the DMZ, up above the DMZ. We went to Hue, eh, Hue. we went to Da Nang, we went to Khe San. And then we went to the Renew um, uh, campus where they work with this, uh, the results of our unexploded ordinance. So here's a poem entitled Unexploded Ordinance, a ballad for Chuck Searcy and the thousands of Vietnamese who are working to undo what we have done. So I was maybe all 21 when they whipped me into some kind of soulless shape. Yet another one of America's weeping mother's sons sent forth into this world to raise, pillage, and rape. And now it's coming on to another Christmas Eve and songs of joy and peace fill up our little town. How, I ask myself, could I possibly believe I could do what I did and not reap what I had sown? In that land far away from what I call home, a grandfather leads his granddaughter by the hand into a field where we did what had to be done. They trip into a searing heat brighter than a thousand suns. The day the rainforest died. Yes, the rainforest came. Thank you. The decade the rainforest died, the deer did not stop running. Leopards climbed into trees that could not hide them. The Duke Lanker and the white-cheeked Gibbon cursed at the metal gods we flew, raining on them as they burned from napalm. Elephants choked on the smoke of gunpowder and poison as their steps, their steps a strange rhythm as they tried to fly. The thunder of bombs echoed the steps of elephants. Tigers exploded as they stepped onto landmines. In a forest covered with leaves dead from Agent Orange, fallen trees and decomposing bodies of animals and people, the earthworms were washed away in monsoons with soil that could no longer grab onto roots. The Javan rhinoceros and the wild water buffaloes that were still alive wandered aimlessly. Weary with M16s and AK-47s, we marched quietly and steadily, not knowing why we were killing each other. Wow, thank you, Teresa. Wow. Let me let me conclude our session together, Teresa's in mind, but first of all, by just telling her once again what an incredible honor it is to be sharing poems with, with you, Teresa. This is a remarkable experience. Um, you too, Doug. Yeah, yeah. This this last poem I, I'm going to read is called uh, "You Should Write About It," which is if you're you know if you're a veteran, you know a lot of people you know if you're sitting at a local bar and yeah, why don't you write a book about it, man? Christ, you know, shut up, just write a book about it. So here's a poem called "You Should Write About It," uh, about my experience of being in the 715th Artillery. You should write a book about it, like that time you held that hand, or when the stars burst into flares. Or how about when the earth flew away before your eyes? And how about that smell? Maybe you should write a manual detailing how to burn your shit and diesel fuel before breakfast. Or maybe you could write a song about the 175s and the 8-inchers blowing away your eardrums. Or perhaps a poem to the girls in their wooden faces making love to the moon bouncing behind your shoulder. But how about it? It's been a while. I know you still got it in you. Write something, anything, God damn you. It won't kill you, you know, at least not any more than it already has. So that concludes our part of this reading. Um, and now we are going to take uh, the, the floor over to, the mic over to um, some folks who have sent their poems ahead of time and then others who have jumped in. So at this point, um, I would like to um, ask Augustine Abarca. Are you here, Augustine? Augustine, am I pronouncing? 
There's an Augustin Abarca in the crowd. No. Okay. Um, how about Janet Wheel? Janet, are you here? Well, now. The floor is opening up. Okay. Um, these are folks who sent, uh, they were on to read poems. Daniel Glover. Are you Daniel? Are you here? <laughs> I I suggest that if there are people in the room that would like to read or re, uh, recite a poem to raise your hand and yep. the, the mechanical hand down there. <laughs> All right. So Becky's in charge of this now. So, um, in order of the raised hands, so we, we're seeing uh, nine seven three five six two zero six five. What were you? Uh, the first raised hand, right? Or Becky, you want to run this? <clears throat> yeah, I'm on it, and I've I have spotlighted Hassan as our beginning. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, hey Doug. I heard you in 2017 in Chicago. That poem about your granddaughter, man, in Rhode Island, man, it still sticks with me. Thank you, oh. man. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. This is called Not for Cowards. Active nonviolent resistors. Consider others as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Agape love. Not for cowards. With movement of the whole, the goal, are we building or destroying? Working for the peaceful community, intentions matter. To strike is easy. To feel the other and self, the violence done to body, mind, spirit, and soul is not for cowards. With movement of the whole, the goal, are you building or destroying? Working for the peaceful community, intentions matter. Somehow, I must disarm to feel inside, look within at the violence I inflict upon others and self is not for cowards. With movement of the whole, the goal, am I building or destroying? Working for the peaceful community, intentions matter. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That's Amazing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to add uh, Jan Barry. He's the next up here. Okay. I'm spotlight him and then unspotlight Hassan. Thank you so much for that. Am I live? Yes, you are. It's up to you. Uh, someday, yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to show very quickly the cover of my new book waging art uh, and I have a poem that's very short but it is related to the visit of the um, golden rule ship sailing ship to the New York New Jersey area uh, and it, the crew visited Newark New Jersey which is where this poem is set legacy in Newark near the Agent Orange factory site the Passaic River flows serenely Nothing to see of the poison in the fish and blue crabs under the surface or in the war veteran with the walker on the riverbank. Thank you. Wow. Thank, Thank you, Jan. You, Jan. Okay. you know what I, get? I have? I used to teach this course in peace studies at the university. Okay. Can you hear me? Oops, I'm sorry. I should. Okay. I just gonna say I used to teach this course, and I would talk about the power of political art and poetry, and and we're looking, we're witnessing it right now. Thank you. Hello, Kathy. You're next. Looks like Kathy Kelly's next. Yeah. Thank you, dear friends. I'm thinking about the cluster munitions still being sent to other parts of the world, including Ukraine, and Wilfred Owen who died in the trenches of World War I, if you could but hear, my friend, at every jolt, the blood come gargling forth from frost-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitten 
as the vile cud of incurable sores on innocent tongues, he would not speak, my friend, with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce e decorum est pro patria mori. Thank you. Yeah. Speak for Jesse Wilfred Owen, to the best war poets ever to tread this planet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Our next poet is Steve Morse. Welcome, Steve. Hi. If you were at the climate workshop today, uh, Anaya Butler talked about leading about 400 youth uh, from Youth versus Apocalypse on November 10th last year. And they were they were protesting climate crisis, environmental racism, and militarism. And we marched from the Embarcadera to the financial district in San Francisco, where there was an office of Lockheed Martin. So I wrote this poem and for that occasion and read this poem as a call and response in front of the Lockheed Martin office. This is called Lockheed. Uh -huh. Lockheed Martin, Lockheed, Lockheed. Heed what I'm saying. They have a lock, a lock on our tax money so much it ain't funny. A lock on weapons contracts that expand and never contracts. Politics, they sure do lock it. They got Congress in their pocket. Some lock up a career complete Pentagon to executive suite. A lock on our minds so we hate those who as enemies they designate. A lock on our minds so we ignore a trillion dollars for war. A lock on our minds so no one sees 800 bases overseas. A lock on our minds so intense we think it's about defense. They lock and load the weapons that others fire on our sisters and brothers. Lock heed. Lock heed. Heed the call to unlock, unlock our own and others' minds. We won't be left behind. Unlock and open the door. We'll put an end to war. Unlock to heal the planet. Together we get to plan it. We do anger. We do caring. We do love. We do sharing. As our efforts increase to bring justice and peace. Thank you. Wow. Oh, thank you. So th there was a call and response poem, like you read, read well, it? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, like uh, mic check in Occupy, you know. Yeah, 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 cool. I said a line. And I didn't think it worked so well on Zoom. It, it would take <clears> twice <throat> as long, so. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. And we got Alice next, I think, right? And and Kara. Whoa. Okay, Alice and Kara, yeah. Yeah. You're on. Okay, play it. We have, uh, I think we have an ability to share the screen. We have uh, the lyrics that people could sign, uh, sing, sing along with. Along with. And uh, the actual, and I, that should be showing now on your screen. Yep. Okay. Yep. There it is. Yeah. And I, the music. I don't know if the media player, let me try to. Uh, oh, yeah. I want. I don't want to have a new share. I want to put in the the, the music as well. I don't know if I can do that. Well, I have it up. You have it to. Uh, maybe I'll try to play it like it is. Yes. And uh, Alice, do you want to give an introduction? It's your song. Yes. Um. Uh, this song came to me when I was missing my. Uh. My second husband, uh, and uh, his name was Carmine Velardi, and uh, he died. And when we went to, uh, I finally got to two grief groups a year, uh, two grief groups a week for a year. Uh, the facilitator said to the, our group of grief people, 
what gift did your loved one leave you? And I quick shot my hand up and he, he left me his Italian family. And by extension, he left me the world. And then I came to uh, hear, hear the, uh, this melody, um, the original one I heard was Nana Muscuri, very sensuous. But then later on, Elisa Ote played it and she played it upbeat. So this is the upbeat version, if Kara can get it on. Okay. Yep. Go for it. <laughs> Oh, yes. Where all come together in peace. One world, one we will be. If we don't know the in spite of differences between you and me, will you reach out your hand and take my hand from me? Together we can, together we will bring peace to our one way. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you. Yes. Brave. Brave. <laughs> you know, yeah. Writing songs is, is just a, a, a whole different world. Thank you so much. I hope you like it. Very much so. Thank you. Thank you. Bahar is next, I believe. If I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yep. Got to unmute yourself. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Uh, my name's Jason. I don't have a Zoom. It's my wife's oh. account. Uh, Jason Mazula I'm in Veterans for Peace, Chapter 113 in Hawaii. Oh. And, um, the title of the poem is called Why an Elegy for Lahaina. As we watch the sun rise and we watch our son play, I'm scared to death wondering what we're going to say when he asks us one day why. Why there are always bullets and bombs galore. Why there is always money for war and war. Why there is always money to kill. Why there is always money for rich men to get richer and richer still, filling their pockets as war stocks follow the rockets sky high. But why, oh why does such a wealthy nation have to rely on donations when disaster strikes? And why does Maui Electric always have rate hikes if they can't fix old poles? And why does it take them hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to cut the power after the lines go down? And why do we have sirens if they're not going to make a sound in the precious moments they're needed most? And why did the children of the missionaries dry out the wetlands that once lined the coast just to sell sugar to sweeten the theft? And why do they keep taking and taking and taking and taking until there's nothing left, until a whole town is turned to ash and an occupied nation is bereft? And there's microplastic in the sand and UXO throughout the land and naval sewage in Pearl Harbor and fuel oil leaching in the water. And native sons and native daughters have little option but to flee as their Ina is used and abused by the US military war drum drumming for World War III, and by the chemical seed companies sowing their greed, and by the extractive tourist industry turning a caricature of Hawaiian culture into a commodity, and more and more and more and more people who look like me 
by home number two or home number three so they can visit these million dollar homes once or twice annually to spend a few weeks by the sea and make a killing the rest of the year from Airbnb. Why must tourists fly to an island still counting the dead? Why can't they fly somewhere like Florida instead or better yet just donate some of their bread to ensure the survivors have all their needs met instead of jump without jumping into an ocean of debt? To our precious son Omid will respond with the truth so he'll help fight for justice with both nail and tooth. He'll know mama and baba are asking why too and it's got too much to do with the red, white, and blue. Wow, oh, thank you. Wow. You know, I'm a, I'm a thousands of miles away from you in Maine right now, but what you just said, read to us right now, means more than any numbers or statistics that I've heard about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dieter, you're up next. Got to un unmute, and you're all set to go. Somewhere there's an unmute button where you had to hit on the screen. Or maybe Becky, can you unmute, Dieter? No, I can only request him to unmute. Um, should be the mic on the I got it. You, go. you got it. Thank yep. you. Okay. Um, I'm a member of the San Diego chapter. Uh, and I'm also uh, an immigrant from Germany. And I'm also a an Army veteran, 28 years. And the title of my poem for this evening is The Delusions That Control Us. We delude ourselves into thinking that we are free and that our freedom needs to ring loud in the hamlets of Afghanistan where we try to sell that commodity in the longest war in our history. We delude ourselves into thinking that our cluster bombs will make Ukrainian children free. But what if they mistake one for a soccer ball? She's finally free and looks so happy now, our dead little Anushka. We delude ourselves into thinking that the young ISIS terrorist will try to kill us all when the NRA and our Second Amendment domestic terrorists do a much better job of it. We deluded ourselves into thinking that in 1945, we were the greatest generation fighting in a segregated army against the Krauts and the Japs. But at the Bermuda Conference, we did nothing to save Aunt Frank. We deluded ourselves into thinking that the domino must not fall, and that killing two million Vietnamese civilians would be well worth the price to protect them from communism. We deluded ourselves into thinking that we could bomb Serbia into a happy consumer paradise where a drab looking Serbian woman would finally be free to choose between a red, a white, or a blue blouse. We delude ourselves into thinking that going to war with China, potentially causing annihilation, is a necessary risk we have to take in order to protect our access to the chip industry of Taiwan. We also delude ourselves into thinking that we need to free the Chinese middle class from a stifling communist regime but what can we offer them that they don't already own? We delude ourselves into thinking that the climate crisis is only caused by countries like India. And if they just ate their damn holy cows, their <laughs> farts wouldn't produce any more methane. We delude ourselves into thinking that the nuclear first strike option is an option that could free us from this endlessly depressing climate brouhaha, we could just choose nuclear winter over a burning planet. Bingo. Bingo. 
The power of political poetry. Thank you so much, right? Taking everything right from this political scene right now and turning it into a poem. Bless you. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Robert, next. Bob Hansen from 102 Veterans for Peace. The Golden Rule comes sailing in here next Wednesday or Thursday, and we're very excited about cool. the five days that we will, four days that we will have with them. Uh, this poem comes from one of my new my new book, No Destination, It's Just the Journey. It's on Amazon, and I have a short parable from the Cherokee Nation in honor of Chief Warren. This poem is called Untitled. It's really just kind of reflections of being a poet these days. Hmm. A lot of talk about freedom these days, a lack of it, or too much of it, take your pick, in a society filled with privilege and fear. I live by Lake Michigan. The lake is calm. The waves are small today. Yet it can be cold as can be. The boats are docked and out of the water. Some wrapped like a candy bar, ready for another season of sailing. How does one get ready for another season? Wrapped in fear and uncertainty. Breath, just breathe, sitting quietly like a wrapped boat, yet not a season, but the next moment. When sitting here writing, it's that Western kind of education, always have an answer. Be sure you are clear rather than letting it flow. Thinking about the coffee I made this morning, they say it's lotus from Vietnam, you wonder, what was that feel like, field like? Where does coffee grow? 50 years ago, what happened in that place? You know, something did. Bodies fell, some saved, some buried. Good taste, many memories. Life goes on, doesn't it? How does one stop being held by memories? I keep asking, where is the filing cabinet where I can place those memories. Mm -hmm. Middle of January, ground is brown, not green. Rain, more rain. Where's the snow? It's kind of depressing. But we make it one breath at a time. Quote, I've been saying mantras and prayers for the aliens to come and rescue us, unquote. And Waldman's new book, Bard Kinetic. Who are you calling on, friends? I'm serious. I know you aren't religious. I get it. But as a human being, you're more spiritual than you know or want to admit. Something has to happen. When is the last time you said, this thing is a mess? I mean, the government, the nation. Maybe the aliens can help. Who knows? It starts with our stories. The other day, a friend asked me about a place where I lived and worked, and I ended up telling my story. He already knew the story, but he gave me the freedom to tell it again. How does this work? We ask each other for a story, a place, a time in our journey, and something happens, a conversation, not a political or religious belief, just our story of who we are, really. I believe that that is when a poet becomes a warrior. A poet becomes a warrior of peace, not war. I am a warrior poet. Language, words, phrases, paragraphs that point to a way, but not a conclusion. We are creating a new narrative of the journey. A journey not to nowhere but a journey that takes us everywhere. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're really a Zen monk, aren't you? 
Yeah, I am. Yeah. I want to read this short story in honor of our chief that spoke so eloquently tonight, if I may. Well, let's, can we, um, we're running short on time. How long is it going to take? I think. Two minutes. Two minutes. Go. And just this, just now. Teaching his grandson about life. I think everybody knows this story. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight, and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And the same fight is going on inside you, dear grandson, and inside everyone. And the grandson thought for a minute and said, Grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. Yeah, Thank beautiful. You. Thank you. That's Thank one you, of my man. favorites. Thanks. Um, I think we got Pat Scanlon on next. Was that, did I see hmm. Pat on there next? I'm on there. Hey, am man. I, am I unmuted? Oh. Hi. <laughs> Good seeing you, man. Yeah. I'm glad you had a great trip. Uh, that's, that's super. Cause, uh, I'm cool. going with, uh, Paul Cox. I think I told you this. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in October. Yeah. So just as a, and I say to people, um, I'm not a prolific songwriter, but I've written a lot of songs, I've, but anyway, um, and I tell people, look, you, uh, sink the rainbow warrior or you go and start a fucking war or you throw me in jail and you might get a song out of it. And um, so going back to Vietnam, um, uh, I wrote a song that, so you are the first ever to hear this completed song. Um, I'm going to recite it. I'm not going to play it. Um, and, um, but just a, just a, a little bit of prelude to this. Um, and uh, I'm not proud of this at all, but I was at MACV headquarters. I was an intelligence analyst top secret clearance, I was in targets division. So um, B-52s. So there's a, there was a team, that's, that was the division, um, 30, maybe 40 of us. Um, we didn't uh, drop the bombs, but we planned every B-52 strike in, in Vietnam. And in 69 was a intensification of the bombing. Uh, one other note is, and so I personally, I personally, did the bomb damage assessment on B-52 strikes. Uh, general Abrams, the commanding general, was 10 doors down from my office, from our office. So, um, and one of this is, so my pain from the war didn't stop when I came home. Um, John Kerry went to Laos, um, if people remember uh, many years ago, uh, when he's in the Obama administration, and they told him, that since the end of the war, 20,000 Laotians had been killed by unspent ordnance. Um, and that, you know, just what we're talking about with Chuck Sarcy, which I'm going to be meeting him. And um, so um, when I was there was the systematic destruction of the plane of jars, those strikes were planned in my office. And um, so those strikes, those 20,000, in other words, those bombs that we planned, my team, are still killing people, both in Laos and in Vietnam. And so this is my song. Uh, and I am I called the uh, second tour. I'm going back from my second tour. <clears throat> I'm headed back to Vietnam for my second tour. My first tour was in 69, the memories endure. I come in peace and friendship. I come with open arms. I want to know you as a friend, wishing you no harm. 54 years ago, on Tiger Airlines freight, 300 of us landed in a place so filled with hate. Bodies on the wire, they attacked again last night. Scared kid from Philadelphia is about to join the fight. Intelligence analysts, Saigon Mac VHQ, Targets Division, BDA B-52s. 
How many killed by bombs drop both night and day? Maybe tens of thousands, it's impossible to say. My team at MACV, we didn't drop the bombs, but we told the pilots where to drop throughout South Vietnam. From Crang Tree to Vinh Binh and everywhere in between, three and a half million bombs, thanks to the war machine. 365 days of living hell. Wonder if this trip will help. Only time will tell. 58,000 dead, 100,000 maimed. When will we ever learn? Any war's insane. Midway through my tour, I began to question why. Death, destruction every day. One day sat down and cried. War is not the answer. Never was and never will. Now I work for peace, my friend. Never more to kill. I hold out my hand to you, my NVA friend. The war against your country long ago came to an end. We are now two aging warriors with only stories left to tell. I want to hear your stories, friend, and I will share mine as well. I'm headed back to Vietnam for my second tour. My first tour was in 69, memories endure. I come in peace and friendship. I come with open arms. I want to know you as a friend, wishing you no harm. Thank you, Pat. Thanks. You know, we, we when they brought the Golden Rule to Portland, Maine, we had a huge banquet. And we ended the banquet with Pat Scanlon singing one of his songs. He brought down the house. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. I think we've got Bob Rudy up next. Is that correct? Yep. Hey, thank you. Uh, Pat, I, I wouldn't say this except what I heard just before. I, uh, I was in the Army 65, 68. My combat zone was... Uh, Caribbean, Dominican Republic, and uh, when I came back, uh, I ended up at the Pentagon Defense Intelligence Agency in uh, in my last year, 60, 68, and I used to take the uh, bomb results from uh, the bombing the day before in Vietnam to Kissinger at the White House hmm. the next day, yeah. And I, you know, I couldn't read everything uh, that was wrapped up, but when I got out of the Army, I started hanging out with the Quakers and been with them ever since mm -hmm. because of everything I knew we were doing over there. Um, and I went over to Vietnam for the first time with my, uh, with my two grandkids, nine and 12, and my daughter on a middle school trip last uh, March and April, a few months ago. And uh, we went all, all over the country, and I like the people a great deal. So it's uh, I was glad to have a chance to to see it now with my with my grandkids. I wrote a, a poem uh, listening to you folks earlier, just sitting here. So I'll share it and see if it's not too bad. And I'm dedicating it to. Gary and Helen, I saw Gary was on earlier. I don't know if he still is. I met I met them when uh, they came by Happy to Grace, Maryland, where I live. And uh, we hosted the Golden Rule, and they stayed overnight at our little farm. So this is for uh, Gary and Helen. And uh, I said it, I wrote it about an hour ago. And it's entitled To the World We Share. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love them as you would be loved. Don't hate them or show anger. To them, ask their forgiveness and forgive them. Forgive their anger and hate to you and hurt to you. Let us live together in peace. With all creatures, we share this earth under the under our heavens. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Wow. On the spur of the moment, eh? Hey. Eh? 
Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. Thank you. You guys inspire me, you know? You're great. <laughs> so we got Mike Ferner up. And is Doug Loomis with us still? Because Doug was uh, originally going to read. Is he here? Um, Doug He's Loomis and Steve Morris. I see Mike. Doug Loomis. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I read already, Doug. Steve. Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, Michael, what you doing, bud? <laughs> hey, you're on mute, which was a good thing. You're still on mute. <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I can put it back on mute if you want, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can read lips. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read this. Uh, um, I... I Originally, I raised my hand to come on just to thank everybody for uh, participating in this. But uh, fortunately, I was uh, far enough back in the queue that um, I listened to a good number of them. Um, I, I came in, but well, doesn't matter. I heard a whole bunch of you and you were all good. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things made me think of is maybe I should write a poem for next year, even though I've never written one in my life. Um, yeah. Now I find out they don't have to rhyme. You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, so I might do one. Uh, I'm hearing people talk about their exact experiences, and you know, uh, perhaps poets do that more than prose writers. And um, it just made me think of some of my exact experiences, and um, they. You know, everybody's got their own exact experiences. And I always say, well, mine weren't that big a deal, but uh, they can be, you know. And uh, yeah. so I, that's kind of what I'm hearing from people is uh, yeah. just be able to listen to uh, people's stories carefully. And then maybe you can do that easier through a poem than some other ways. So thank you all very much. Yeah, Mike, my, my, my poetics comes from the idea that a poem comes from the gut, not from the mind, right? And and also, uh, poets do, are not, uh, aren't, aren't under the, the same kind of uh, strictures as uh, essayists and short story writers and novelists, because we can just, with a poem, you don't have to have a beginning, middle, and an end. You can just go right into something. Boom. What was it like being a medic? What was it like that moment you stuck your first IV into a patient? Huh? There's a poem. So, uh, and I, I could go on. Uh, so, I Doug Loomis, Doug. We see Doug anywhere? Doug, Doug, Doug. Becky, I see a note that says Doug is here. Yeah, there you go. You want to unmute, unmute yourself there, Doug? Still muted. Okay, how about now? You're good. Okay, can I? Yeah. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of you folks, uh, I've never seen combat, which means that when I write a, a piece of doggerel maybe once every 10 years, it doesn't bring tears uh, uh, in the way that those personal experiences do. Uh, I've never seen combat, but living as I do now in Okinawa, in the next few months, I may have my first chance. Uh, it looks pretty bad. Uh, this poem was written in uh, 2005, right after the uh, hurricane destroyed New Orleans, also right after Desert Storm. And it's called George Bush Meets Theresius on Bourbon Street. You remember Theresius was the Greek uh, prophet. Old drunk fuddling down New Orleans town, looks up, says, Jesus, not that clown. Says, what the hell are you doing here? Checking the action, looking for beer? Big chief just keeps on walking by, gives old drunk a wink on the sly. Drunk gets mad. Damn pinhead prez, I'm talking to you, the old man says. Ignore that guy, the suits all say. Don't even slow down, let's get away. 
But Prez turns around with his usual smirk, says, look, you guys, I can handle this jerk. Says, well, old man, how goes it with you? Do, do hurricanes bother the winos too? Old drunk rises up, eyes ablaze, pins big chief on his gimlet gaze, says, oil man, spoil man, listen to me. You blind as a bat, gonna teach you to see. Just stay put, stay put, mister, there in your shoes. Gonna preach you a sermon you can't refuse. Now I'm no born again, once is enough. But what's happening here is Old Testament stuff. It's the big flood, mister, hit this town. It's fire and brimstone coming down. Now I don't know who raised their hand. It's a goddamn clear, but it's goddamn clear there's a curse on this land. It might be Yahweh, it might be Jove, it might be Gaia herself on the move, but it's clear to anyone with eyes to see that what we've got here is Gulf Storm 3. Put you, you put yourself above God, earth, and man, saying, screw their laws, got a better plan. So look what you've done, you simpering clown. You smirk at the law, bring the furies down. Then old drunk begins to cough and weep, sits down on the street, all in a heap. Now the suit's been to college, their turn to smirk. The suits say the old that old man ain't done his homework. He's smuddling Greek myths with the word of God. The result, to say the least, is pretty odd. But big chief, he stands there white as a sheet. The sermon pounds inside him, bones and meat. Then he shakes his head a little and the smirk comes back. Yeah, what, what the hell's a drunk no? living in a shack. So the presidential party continues on its way and way off in the distance, hounds begin to bay. <laughs> Wonderful. The end rhyme, my friend, you've got that nailed. Thank you. Now, Wonderful. Since, since uh, one other person uh, showed their book, uh, I'm gonna do the same if I may. Sure. Uh, Doug used, uh, read a poem in which a, a village in Vietnam was on the other side of the river Styx. Yeah. That hit my attention because I this is the ah. title ah. of the book I just published ah. this year. Ah. Uh, oh. Based on the oh. same notion. What yeah. is it exactly that war and hell have in common aside from being horrible. This uh, picture is by an Okinawan uh, uh, woodblock writer. You can see there's a, a nice looking uh, one of us when we were young, uh, Marine or Army guy, uh, spewing out hell on uh, mm. actually a uh, four-legged animal. But that's again in the Battle of Vietnam. Pardon me, the Battle of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, the flamethrower was used. Uh, hey, hey, you know, yeah. It, it, when you're talking to me right now, you can't look at the chat room, but I'm looking at this. Says, "Hey, he rocks!" Whoa, I hear Bob Dylan. Well, this book is really good. <laughs> so you're getting all this praise on the chat room. Well, I, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we got Rudy. We got Rudy up next, and Ann Wright, I think, right? Uh, that uh, next, yeah, Rodolfo, Rudy, I suppose. You got to unmute. Yep, unmute and take it away. I got gotcha. you. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Greetings from California, from Ojai, the epicenter of the latest earthquake out here. Mm. <clears throat> My name is uh, Rudy Chavez Razo, R A Z O. It's a very significant uh, 
irony and incongruity as they are in our lives uh, very often because, uh, and my poem is titled Soldado Razo, R-A-Z-O, um, subtitled American Me. And uh, Soldado, of course, is soldier and Razo is, in Spanish, it means foot soldier. So that is my mother's uh, um, last name and my father's uh, Chavez. <clears throat> Again, this poem is titled Soldado Razo, American Me. I was one of the proud, the proud and the few, yet at the same time, I was one of the many. Chicano, Chicano, United States Marines from the halls of Moctezuma to the shores of Tripoli. When I turned 18, I got databased, priority numbered, listed 2196844. Stamped on the head at the top of the line of the crop of the core. And I was ordered to stand at attention because with no high school retention, I'd spent so much time in detention. I got pushed out from an education when I turned 16 on May 10, my 10th, my, my birthday, which is Mexican Mother's Day too. I was one of the proud and the few, yet at the same time, I was one of the many Chicano, 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 Mexican, Hispanic, American, United States Marines. In the harvest of bodies, in the harvest of booties, the brown and the Indian and the black and the white, all of the poor, we all got inducted. We all got sent to war. But no, 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 they said, in Vietnam, that's not really a war. It's a police action. Mm. More like a fucking knee-jerk reaction. There was no other choice, no other window, no other door. In fact, I had no voice. And Uncle Sam took me ASAP. I was a GI, government issue. But I knew and I know I was not a Joe. You see, I was Jose. And about this, today, I got lots more to say. Such as, chinga tu madre pinche way. At night, at the San Diego airport, we got prodded, stuffed into a vomit-colored green bus. We got stuck three to a seat, made for two, upright, neat, meat as we sat at attention, stiff in submission and fear, without a blink, a wink, or a twitch for any itch, we was immobilized. At MCRD, I was lined up, a DI's face in my personal space, screaming and spitting an infinity of obscenities, and we got scolded, and then we got balded, my curly hair scalped. What a mess, gone in 10 seconds or less. And for any possible harm, we got shot in both arms and we got uniformed and booted and shined up and we slept half at attention till we got waked up, shit showered and shaved over the coals rake, maggots, 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 marching in formation, more in deformation till death do us part. I was one of the proud, the proud and the few, Yet at the same time, I was one of the many, the many, 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 many Chicano, Mexican, Hispanic, Spanish-speaking Marines, American, me, Soldado Raso, private, from the balls of Moctezuma to the shores of Tripoli, first to fight and first to die. United States, United States Marines, on land or air or sea, my country deserves of thee, my country deserves of thee. Thank you. You know, you know, I, I I used to teach at a, at a university and I taught first year students and they would look at an old guy like me and say, you don't know anything about performance poetry, do you? And I said, by God, I'm listening to you, man. And I say, you got it. That 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 was amazing. Thank you. I mean, that's the, the kind of the vibrant life that a poet has to put out there on the stage nowadays. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah. 
Uh, Anne Wright, we're going to finish our reading with Anne Wright, who's a person who needs no introduction at all. Well, thank you very much and what beautiful, beautiful poems and readings and everything. And I just made this one up for everyone. Roses are red, violets are blue, veterans for peace. I love you. Thank you and good night. <laughs> okay. Well, you couldn't have done it better than that. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, as Becky has been putting in the notes, the chat room here, This, if you want to pr print your poem, send it to Becky, right? Her email, and uh, we'll put it out. No, Becky's shaking her head. No. Uh oh. Wrong advice. Yeah, I, I put it in the chat a couple of times. Basically, yeah. anyone who wants to give us their permission, send me your work. Some of you already have uh, to the, the VFP editor. It's called editor at veteransforpeace.org. Again, that address is editor at veteransforpeace.org. Put poem in capital letters in the subject line and uh, we'll get it done. Uh, you know, it's usually those books. Usually, we usually sell about one hundred and fifty thousand copies of those, and each one is, goes for about thirty bucks. And so, each one of us will receive probably two bucks. So, no, it's a, it's a, a, you know, as with Veterans for Peace, it's a volunteer thing, and there's lots of stuff going out there. So, again, thank you all. What a great way to end the evening. Um, thank you. Take care. A really great poetry session tonight. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you thank you, thank you. Take care.